Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future Interview podcast. I'm Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future Interview. And for those of you who have never heard of Future Interview before, we run the annual FIRE conference, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. Now, the other arm of our business, Strategic News Service, provides its subscribers with the most accurate source of information about the future of technology and the global economy. Um, if you enjoy these updates, you can subscribe to Strategic News Service for access to all of our in-depth weekly reports. And I'm here today talking with Scott Foster, who is the editor of our quarterly Asia Letter and the author of this week's Global Report, uh, which is focused on the new era in the Philippines. So Scott is joining us today from Tokyo. Scott, welcome. It's great to have you here. Hello. Yeah, very nice Hello. to be talking with you today. So I want to ask you a quick question. We're going to get into a little bit more about why you're focusing on the Philippines um, this in this in this quarter's Asia letter. This is a, f- a feature that we do once a quarter. Um, your perspective f- from Asia in general. Um, but to start, what is the economic and military significance of the Philippines as it relates to the South China Sea and the area around it? Well, as we'll we'll see with the uh, the maps uh, later, uh, the Philippines is located in a very strategic position uh, Mm -hmm. off the coast of China, just south of uh, Japan and Taiwan. Uh, It's a fairly large uh, country. Uh, The economy is medium sized, but it's growing very rapidly, about 7% per year. Uh, And uh, for those uh, who are not familiar with the history, The United States had an enormous military presence there for almost a century. Uh, The Philippines was a colony of the United States. Uh, The American bases uh, at uh, Clark Airfield and Subic Bay were closed uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, But now, uh, thanks to the bullying of China uh, and uh, uh, the deterioration of the strategic situation in East Asia, uh, the Philippines has invited American armed forces back. Uh, and the Japanese are also getting closer to the Philippines, both militarily and economically. And that has resulted in a major change in the strategic situation in East Asia, uh, which is it's probably the biggest change uh, that's happened in recent months. Okay, so let's take a look at, I'm, you mentioned these maps. I'm going to share them now so people can see kind of what you're talking about. Um, but in your report, you write about the first and second island chains and the significance of those. Can you walk us through a little bit of what we're seeing here and, and why they matter? Okay, well, the naval strategists regard these two lines as mm-hmm. the primary lines of defense from our point of view, or lines of containment from the Chinese point of view uh, in the Western Pacific. And you can see the, the first chain runs from the southwestern Japanese island of Kyushu through Okinawa uh, Mm -hmm. to Taiwan and then the Philippines. Right. And the second chain uh, runs south uh, from Tokyo and from Miyokosuka, where the seventh fleet is headquartered, uh, down to Guam and Saipan in the northern Marianas, uh, Mm -hmm. on uh, to Palau, uh, Mm -hmm. Micronesia, and then down to Indonesia. So uh, the Chinese want to break out of this containment and Mm -hmm. Americans and their allies, Japan uh, first, want to maintain those lines of defense. Uh, Imagine what the first line of defense, what the first island chain looks like if you're Chinese. And then imagine uh, what it looks like if you take out the Philippines. Right. That's, that's the that's the first uh, the first check, the first map. And so, so basically, it's, it's it's creating this kind of uh, a bubble effect almost, where you have much more instantaneous access to China via water or air uh, than if the Philippines is not on your side. If, exactly. To put it bluntly. And if you if you look at at Taiwan, Taiwan is generally regarded as the the stopper in the bottle. If the if the Chinese take Taiwan, uh, they will have a, a much wider gap uh, to go through, 
to get to the wider Pacific, mm -hmm. the Pacific Ocean, and also the island of Taiwan has has a very has a deep water ports on the eastern coast, which right would be, okay uh, convenient for Chinese submarines. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> if we lose Taiwan, then mm -hmm. the first island chain jumps from Okinawa right to the Philippines. And in that case, the and Philippines that becomes a wide gap, gap even, right even in here. more important. Well, you can't see Okinawa on this map, but Okinawa runs almost to Taiwan. So you see how the, the first island chain bends toward Taiwan and then mm -hmm. turns 90 degrees south. Japanese islands go almost to that bend in the line. So that's Okinawa is, is a very long archipelago uh, closing off the East China Sea. Uh, and but if you take Taiwan out, there is a substantial gap between Okinawa and the Philippines. And if you take the Philippines out, there is no first island chain, really, just Japan and Okinawa. Right. So, okay, so let's, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna stop sharing again just for a second. And okay. I would I would love to hear a little more from you about what is happening right now, economically and militarily, that is so significant in the Philippines. Okay, well, uh, the Philippines has a, a new president, uh, Ferdinand Marcos, this junior. Mm -hmm. uh, he's uh, commonly known as Bong Bong Marcos, but he's a mm -hmm. very serious guy. And in February, uh, he granted the U.S. military access to four new bases in the Philippines, in addition to the five that are already available for joint exercises and the prepositioning of equipment. Uh, under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement between the two countries. Um, so, was there something that prompted? Was there something that prompted that move on his part? You know, was it was, was there some kind of yes, fear of China specific act and fear uh, of China in general? And the well, the Chinese have been encroaching uh, on the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, mm -hmm. and the the waters just west of the Philippines uh, are are called by the Philippines, the West Philippine Sea. And that's a concept that I think we should uh, adopt because that as long as you say South China Sea, you're right. convincing it, it, yourself it, it, that it belongs to China. Mm -hmm. But the, the Chinese have moved in to the exclusive economic zone, not only of the Philippines, but all the literal states, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei. Um, and this has created the problem that you read about frequently in the press. And for the Philippines, it means that the Chinese threat is right offshore. Uh, quite recently, uh, a Chinese vessel uh, pointed a military grade laser at a Philippine patrol boat and temporarily blinded the crew. Uh, that's the kind by of- ac By accident, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, by accident. Um, <laughs> And I wrote about that in the in the Asia letter, uh, which is a, a expanded version of what we're talking about today. Uh, it was big news, and it caused the uh, the Philippines to to come up with a more aggressive strategy uh, of publicizing the aggressive acts of China, and in this case, by publishing a video of this uh, laser incident. Anyway, for the Philippines, uh, the South China Sea and Chinese encroachment is not a, a topic for a debate and a theoretical, uh, strategic theoretical uh, concept like you might hear about in Washington, D.C. It's, it's immediate. It's right off the coast. It affects their, right. their fishing boats every they're back, day. It's their back, it's their back, right out their back door. Yeah, right out their front door. Right uh, out, <laughs> probably right out, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so that's that's the situation with the the uh, the maps and what happened in February. Um, we should keep in mind that the the EDCA, uh, the Defense Cooperation Agreement, also allows construction of runways, fuel storage facilities, and military housing. They're they're everything but permanent bases. So this is the this is the new agreement between yes the U.S. The and and, US. Uh, and the Philippines, and this is a also a big story because the previous president of the Philippines, Duterte, Rodrigo mm -hmm. Duterte, did not get along with the United States at all. And he was even thinking of canceling this agreement. 
but before he could do so, um, Donald Trump became president, uh, repaired relations with the Philippines, and now under Biden, they've gone uh, to the next step, which is to expand the EDCA. Now, in, uh, <clears throat> in March, uh, the Philippine Army and the U.S. Army held their largest ever uh, joint exercises. And in April, uh, the uh, combined Philippine and U.S. Armed Forces planned to hold their annual war games, but with about twice as many troops as usual, uh, up to 17,000, according to reports. And this will uh, also include uh, air defense uh, with Patriot missiles, uh, practice exercise in sinking uh, a vessel offshore, a hostile vessel, uh, mm -hmm. and also the use of the high mobility artillery rocket systems, the HIMARS, uh, that have uh, been in the news about Ukraine. Uh, the focus here, of course, is on interop interoperability of the two militaries and the, uh, with a focus again on the, on the advanced technology. So I have a question for you, which is, you know, you, you have, we've, we've talked many times about uh, China and it's a kind of increasingly aggressive stance towards Japan, the Philippines. How much of a deterrent do you think that the U.S. and the Philippines working together on this new military, uh, on these new military exercises and, and base is to the Chinese Communist Party and to Xi Jinping in particular? Oh, I think it's a considerable deterrent. Uh, whether or not it will uh, save Taiwan is a, is a separate question. Uh, but uh, in contrary to some pessimists, I don't think that if the Chinese do take Taiwan, that the Americans will just fold and go away and lose all their credibility. I think that if there is a problem, uh, if there is a, a blockade uh, or an invasion of Taiwan, uh, the new relationship with the Philippines and stronger military ties and cooperation with Japan uh, will just be further reinforced to make sure it stops there and doesn't go any further. Yeah, I agree. I think that's probably very likely. I'm curious, you know, so you you mentioned a couple, at least once in your in your report, um, you know, there was a lot of inaction by past presidents with regard to the Philippines. And I'm curious what you would have, what do you, would you have liked to have seen? Well, at the time, um, there were like many views expressed. The, the Chinese started to uh, uh, build artificial islands in the South mm -hmm. China Sea. Uh, well, first, they, they took some islands away from Vietnam by force, uh, and they moved into uh, Philippine uh, waters and occupied uh, reefs by force. And then they built seven artificial islands, uh, which are now which are now bases. Uh, right. Uh, with with uh, so they're building up all of these bases. They're in, building up all the these bases and contended the, the, waters. The mo yeah, in, in what? everyone else regarded as international waters, uh, right. but the Chinese historically had regarded as their own uh, waters. And you, you've heard of the nine dash line and we'll look at that in a, in a, in a later map. Um, anyway, the Chinese had, had not done anything really about the nine dash line uh, until uh, um, a few years ago. And then they started building islands and President Obama didn't do anything about it. Uh, radical voices in the West said, well, just, just blow them up now. <laughs> Don't let right. them build these so islands. But I'm, that gonna, wasn't I'm gonna pull done. up that. I'm that, gonna pull that up that. Done. Yeah. Uh, the the it's the third line. line. Okay. okay. Let's see. Oop. You can. Oh. <laughs> I think if you go to the title slide and move down, you might get it. That's like, okay, uh, no. For the is bases, there... military bases in the Pacific. Is there one more? Is there one more slide? Yeah, there, there, should should be. Be. there we go. Okay, so count them, nine red dashes. Uh, mm -hmm. There used to be 11, uh, but uh, Joe and Lai eliminated two to keep the Vietnamese happy. Uh, but the Vietnamese, really now are not happy because look where those lines are, right up to the coast, coastlines of all the literal states. And in the middle 
are a lot of islands. The sea is very shallow. Uh, so the nine, just just to clarify that for those who are maybe are not familiar with the nine dash line, this is China's claim of right. what the red lines what, are, are China's belongs. claim, and okay. the dash blue lines are the exclusive economic zones of the literal states. Right. It would uh, make sense, you know, looking at these dash blue lines that you would have a certain amount of water in front of each country that becomes the exclusive economic zone of that country. Well, that's what it is, and that's what the what the uh, law of the sea says too, and that's uh, international standard practice. Uh, but the, the Chinese claim historical precedence, and they still insist that they have rights within those lines. They're a bit vague about uh, about how far those rights go, uh, right. but they have they have not been vague about what they're going to build there. And, and each of these little dots that we're seeing here are is a is a constructed those, those island. Those are, are islands and reefs. Oh, uh, those are existing China, islands. Yeah, China, has, China has built facilities on seven separate islands. Okay, uh, got it. But the the sea is full of shallow reefs, reefs that are uh, visible at high tide, at low tide only, um, and small islands. And the other countries claim some of them too. It's not ex exclusively China, but China is so big and claims so much that that has become an issue. And we also should note, as long as we're looking at that, that map, uh, that roughly one third of global shipping goes through the South China Sea, including 40% mm -hmm. of China's total trade. Uh, and most of the oil and gas transported uh, to mainland China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. So it's a very important sea lane, commercial sea lane. Very, yeah, economically, it's an extremely important sea lane. Extremely Is there does the, does the Philippines agreement, like, and with the with the two sets of lines that we were looking at in the first map, does that create more of a buffer for like what happens if China? suddenly cuts off trade to the U.S. Does that allow for any kind of passage? Oh, I think those are separate issues. Um, the, uh, you know, the blockade, a blockade of the South China Sea could cut both ways. Um, the Americans mm -hmm. might try to stop oil shipments from the Middle East to China. Uh, that I would see. Be, so it could be used by be either side. Step, but it would be in character. Yeah. Uh, and the Chinese depend on those sea lanes as much or more than anyone else. So uh, blocking them uh, is, is not really something that people are worried about. What they're worried about in, in a peaceful scenario, what they're worried about is, is in a, a scenario that's not peaceful and how those bases in the South China Sea uh, could contribute to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. So I think we are about out of time, but I want to ask you one final question, which is in relation to the Taiwanese president visiting China this week, as we're talking about the Philippines, we're talking about Taiwan. Uh, can you give our, our viewers like a little bit of context about the former president visiting Taiwan, or I'm sorry, visiting China for the first time in a very long time saying, we are all Chinese. What does that, politically speaking, what does that mean for the region or if, if anything? There's an election coming up in, presidential election coming up in Taiwan next year. Next mm -hmm. year's a big, big year for presidential right. elections. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of them. And the opposition Kuomintang party in Taiwan has uh, historically been uh, what, in favor of friendly relations with China. And the current okay. government of Taiwan is not. So uh, it's a very important election. And not only has the uh, one of the opposition leaders uh, gone to China, uh, but uh, Terry Go, the, the uh, chairman of Foxconn, the company uh, that makes your iPhone, uh, right. he's also planning to run for, for president again. And of course, he has enormous economic interests in China. So this election coming up next year is going to be very interesting and very important. 
uh, it, it will be uh, basically a referendum on the current government, Taiwanese government, and U.S. policies of uh, trying to block China at every turn. Whether the Chinese support that, sorry, whether the Taiwanese support that or not, it will be decided in the election next year. Any any predictions from you on on which which way things will turn? I think it'll be very close. Uh, and I wouldn't imagine I that it would be, but you... I, I think it will. Polls indicate that it will be close. Uh, many uh, what analysts or academics think that the uh, the current government will will win, um, but it remains to be seen. I mean, a lot can happen in, in the coming year that will change right. the situation. Um, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see, and at least it won't be boring. <laughs> it will not be boring. That is, that is true of the Global Report generally. And Scott, I just want to thank you for, for joining us today uh, and for your incredible reports, uh, quarterly reports in the Global Report from Asia and on the economic and, and general situation from the ground in Tokyo. It, they, they are a huge asset to our members and to our subscribers. So thank you for being with us. And I look forward to your next report. And until then, things will remain interesting. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.